broadcast of this program is made possible in part by the South Carolina Farm Bureau, online at scfb.org. And by the Columbia Metropolitan Airport, online at columbiaairport.com. And by Time Warner Cable, online at timewarnercable.com. And welcome back to this week at the State House as the session of the General Assembly continues on. Issues continue to be debated on the floors. Uh, we've got the question of registration um, of someone who has a mental health problem and has been, um, uh, shall I say, institutionalized. Should they be allowed to purchase a gun without a, they ought to be a checkup or something. That hole is going to be filled in a new law here and it's passed the House of Representatives. It's over in the Senate. It's to be debated. A lot of issues. The budget is, of course, being prepared in the Senate uh, Finance Committee, and we expect that there'll be a budget debate in the weeks ahead. One of the issues being debated in this General Assembly, ethics reform, and that's what we're about today. What is ethics reform? What is it all about? Um, uh, where is it going? Uh, we're going to discuss those issues, but first I want to thank um, Time Warner Cable, the Columbia Metropolitan Airport, and the uh, Farm Bureau of South Carolina for making this broadcast possible as our sponsors. And to the South Carolina Educational Television Network who produces this program for us. And we also had the assistance of the South Carolina Press Association in putting our programs together. So we hope you enjoyed and particularly to our friends in 518 of the Block Building. We understand there's probably a record crowd over there today. Right. Representative Merrill and all of them. Um, and so we always Delighted to have you all there. I think it was you, Representative Stavernakis, that once said this show's like homework for legislators. It gives them the ready answers. Well, you're leaving a little bit out. I said it was like homework for elementary school as well. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me introduce our guest and we're going to get right to our topic today. I've got uh, Representative Leon Stavernakis. He comes to us from Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, he is over in the House of Representatives. He has opinions. He's followed this ethics debate. Right next to him, Senator Luke Rankin from Horry County. He's the senator from there. He's also chairman of the Senate uh, Ethics Committee. So we're going to get a perspective from the Senate and the House about ethics reform. So I'm going to start right out, gentlemen. I'll start with you, Representative. Ethics reform, why is this a subject? Well, I Don't think we have ethics laws? We do, and in some ways we have very strict ethics laws in terms of activities that lawmakers are allowed to engage in. But I think in recent times there's, there's been some public scrutiny of whether we're serious enough about legislative ethics and um, I think we can always do better and that's what we're intending to do is to find whatever loopholes may exist, some that have been exposed in the last year or so and, uh, and maybe tighten those up. Um, I think in the House we could deal with ethics legislation as early as today um, and what that's going to look like is still up in the air. But I think the House, you'll see, is committed to, to be uh, putting things in place that, uh, again, close some loopholes, but also respect the Constitution, the doctrine of separation of powers, and, uh, and try to move our state forward consistent with those, those uh, long-held uh, constitutional structures. All right, let's, let's set the stage for our viewers so they understand what we're talking about. In the current law, the judicial branch has its own ethics. I think they call it judicial standards. All right, then you move to the legislature. The House has a House Ethics Committee. The Senate has a Senate Ethics Committee. Right. Then you have the South Carolina Ethics Commission for the executive branch of government. And they are appointed by the governor who's head of the executive branch. And we have ethics laws in place. Now that having been said, you said that there are loopholes to it. So now I'll come to you, Senator Rankin. Are the loopholes the issue? Is that where is that what's driving uh, this clamor now for ethics reform? Well, obviously there is a hue and cry from 
more the recent history of precedent of where the executive branch has been the subject of ethics problems. Former Governor Sanford, record $74,000 ethics fine uh, for use of the state airplane. Current governor, likewise, with the, the House investigated uh, ethics matter over uh, disclosure of not, uh, or I guess it was, it was income that she got from Wilbur Smith. Uh, that was a ripe issue in her recent campaign. So two examples from the executive branch where this has been a, a bigger problem. And now currently SLED is investigating the uh, Speaker of the House and there's, there may or may not be a House ethics investigation of his use of campaign funds for personal uh, expenditures. We have historically, since Lost Trust, uh, recognized around the nation as one of the toughest ethics laws regarding legislators. Uh, and you can't give anybody anything effectively. Uh, a lobbyist can't buy my cup of coffee. A lobbyist can't give me a ride home, uh, et cetera. Uh, so the, the precedent for this is really from the executive branch. Again, as Representative Stavernaka said, we do need to improve. And there are a number of things that are being debated in the Senate right now uh, in the Judiciary Committee. We've got a, a ethics bill that would try to close some of the loopholes. Disclosure of income. We are all, we, both of us are practicing attorneys. If we appear before a governmental agency, we have to disclose that in our statement of economic interest. Full disclosure, transparency that applies to us. It does not necessarily apply to somebody else who may have a quasi relationship with some business. Right now, you don't have to disclose. Again, most recent example, Governor Haley with the Wilbur Smith contract. There was no rule, apparently, in the House that required that disclosure. So that's really what's driving this current ethics reform debate. Do you agree with his assessment, Representative? I do. I mean, I think you saw in that case last year involving Governor Haley that that's a classic example of a loophole. Um, she was being paid by someone who clearly did business with the state, but because they didn't do business specifically with the House of Representatives as an individual entity, uh, ultimately the ruling was that under the existing standards that did not constitute um, an ethical problem or, or a violation of our ethics laws, and that, that's just way too narrow. I think you'll see us do something about that. Um, but look, I mean, I said the same thing he said pretty much. We, in many ways, have some very strict ethics laws out of, as apply to legislators, but some, you know, people would like to see some of these kinds of loopholes closed, and I think we need to make a good faith effort to do that. But again, it's very important to me, and I think very important to a lot of people in the House that we maintain the constitutional principle of separation of powers. For some reason, you know, the legislature is always an easy target, but as you pointed out, and as you, have, you and I have discussed before, the same situation exists most places, and the same situation exists in all the branches here in South Carolina, where each branch has their own legislative, uh, excuse me, their own ethics governance. And um, that's there for a reason, and if you look at the national model, it's there. It was one of those things that the founding fathers of this country thought was very important so that you didn't have political witch hunts, one, one branch against the other. So let me ask both of you, because it, this issue has come up. Uh, I, I've seen the debate about we got to put the legislature under the Ethics Commission, but if the Ethics Commission is part of the executive branch and our South Carolina Supreme Court just yesterday reaffirmed again the constitutional doctrine of clear separation of powers between executive, judicial, and um, legislative when it slapped the hands of the Budget and Control Board for attempting to usurp the power of appropriation, right. which is the legislative power. <clears throat> and they, again, cite, of course, about it being forever separate. So can you, for instance, put the legislature under the executive branch without a constitutional amendment? I don't believe you can, and I know that there are some people in the legislature that want to go in that direction, but I would, I'm, I'm hopeful the House won't go in that direction. I think that uh, these, 
barriers are in place for very good reasons. They've endured the test of time and served our democracy well on the state and the federal level. And I think they're important. Um, and again, it keeps that balance in place where we don't have one branch conducting political witch hunts against the other simply because they have the authority to do it and there may be personality uh, disagreements between them. Um, but at the same time, I think both branches in, in the legislature, the House and the Senate, need to be very serious about policing their own members. And, and uh, we need to make sure the public has confidence that we will do that, that where we find our members uh, doing things they shouldn't do, that we'll step up and make sure that, uh, that those issues are dealt with appropriately. Your take on a constitutional issue, you want to weigh in on that? Any? Likewise, it, it, the test of time from the founding fathers and the, and the congressional model, folks don't like Congress, but the Constitution likewise sometimes is not liked, but it likewise is, is the model. And the founding fathers envisioned uh, the battles between the judicial, the legislative, the executive branches, and in this instance, executive versus legislative. There's no way that any ethics reform would come out of the Senate, and I dare say the House, <clears throat> that would effectively allow the governor, this governor, any governor, to have a super majority of the appointees on the ethics committee, that effectively he or she could, as he's invoked the term, create and conduct a witch hunt to try to exert political influence. There's no way that's going to happen. We are talking about, and there are various ideas that would allow uh, seeding to a, a mix between equally comprised House, Senate, and executive appointees to a statewide ethics committee. Uh, that would look at the majority party and the minority party. So there's a sense of fairness politically within the party system as well as a vote of those who would be appointed, again, a supermajority to conduct an investigation. Well, let me ask both of you, because you're both lawyers, so this could be a tough question to you. If you're looking at combining the executive and legislative in this super ethics, why aren't you doing it with the judiciary? Well, for me personally, I don't support doing it, um, but I agree with you. That po point has been raised. I don't know why. For some reason, we're being singled out as legislators by certain people. Um, when you look at what we have, the power to whatever degree it exists in an ethics committee is far more diluted in the House of Representatives than it is in the executive branch, where one person, the governor, appoints the entire board that, that oversees the governor's ethics. Um, in the House, the body at large, 124 members, have a voice in deciding, the only voice in deciding who sits on the Legislative Ethics Committee for the House. So again, I think you know, you shouldn't combine these branches of government. I wouldn't want to bother the, ju uh, the judicial branch any more than I want to bother the legislative branch. Um, so that's not anything that I'm going to support, but I take your point well that if, if, if one branch having governance over itself is a problem, it should be a problem for all the branches. Um, but again, I think that that model has served our state and country well, and I think we should tweak it but stick with it. Yes, do you have anything you want to add to that? I agree with that. I mean, you've got judicial canons of ethics. <clears throat> they are monitored. There's a process for, for ethics grievances to be filed. We vet that. You have judicial standards for the election of the uh, judicial candidates. I, so I don't see us getting into that branch any more than they would need to and should get into the executive or to the legislative branch. All right, let me go back now to the legislative branch because this has been one of the issues that's been debated. Legislative, <coughs> I think they call them leadership packs or something, it's a term called leadership packs. Is that going to be dealt with in this ethics reform or is that just something out there that's being discussed? Well, I'm going to jump on that because the Senate's been real clear and our rules, in fact, prohibit our creation of leadership packs uh, where either for good or bad, the perception is, uh, and you hear this, you read this, common calls, a number of groups are, are kind of honing in on the potential for abuse. Uh, what was originally a, a created by, I think, Speaker Wilkins uh, with the intent to perhaps operate a little bit differently, it has, again, from a perception standpoint, created a effective 
way to skirt the $1,000 contribution limit that we as elected of all officers or, or candidates are allowed to get and allows a $3,500 contribution. Uh, it's by rule prohibited in the Senate. The ethics task force that uh, Attorney Generals Medlock and McMaster uh, head and chaired with a lot of input from a lot of people unanimously endorsed getting rid of the leadership packs, which again is not a creation or allowed in the Senate. It's existing now only in the House. Well, then we'll go to the House and see what, what's the mood over there. Well, we're still in the process of, of flushing out a lot of issues, including that one. I'm hopeful the House will deal with that issue and, and, uh, and follow suit with the Senate, and I think I'm optimistic that we will. I think you'll see a change in that area when the ethics bill comes out of the House. All right, let me ask both of you, going back now to lobbyists. Lobbyists, if my understanding of the current law is correct, they don't have to register for purposes of lobbying local government, do they? No. Is that going to be dealt with in, in, in this? The, the Senate bill, each iteration of that Senate bill specifically says that they will have to lobby, and the task force likewise recommended that too. So they will be uh, registering? I think I think I wish I, I had I, Representative Merrill here. I do too. To get some I, wisdom I, on this. I wish I wish he was here also. But I do think that's another thing. I think the House, and I'm hopeful that we'll deal with. I think it's uh, it's something that's kind of been at, uh, an an open hole for a long time about lobbying uh, in local government. And I was in local government, and there's definitely lobbying that occurs, and uh, you don't have the order and accountability of having registration the way you do up here. Let me ask both of you about, there's a growing controversy about committees, these committees that form, I think on like 501c7s or something, and they go out and they recruit money and then they attack and they don't have to reveal where the money's coming from. Is there any discussion regarding those or are they exempted because of free, freedom of speech or whatever? Can either of you comment on what you hear in that particular area? Well, the, the Senate likewise is grappling with that. The, this is a, a product of the Supreme Court's decision a couple of years ago called the Citizens Case, uh, where effectively what was intended to be uh, registered and disclosed, uh, and by the, I don't recall what year this campaign uh, election law came out of Congress, but effectively the Supreme Court said there, you cannot require that disclosure. So we've had campaigns in South Carolina in the recent, recent times where you've got dumping of money by unknown groups at the last minute, they don't have to register, and the, the candidate is either the beneficiary of or the victim of outside groups with a single agenda special interest. So if they're We're, putting false statements out there, you don't know who it is that's putting the false statements or the true statements. It's just... Um, it, it's, a, it's like the shootout at the OK Corral, I guess. It's just whoever place. survives. That's right. Yeah, you know, I'm hopeful we'll deal with that issue. It's a tough issue, though, because you're dealing with uh, case law uh, from the Supreme Court, from the United States District Courts um, that have kind of, as you alluded, thrown us open uh, into the Wild West in a lot of ways. Um, and it's hard to find a way to craft language that would allow that regulation without uh, running afoul of those uh, court decisions. So we need to work on that, but it's a, I think it's a tough issue to find a way to deal with, but I think the public deserves to know who's influencing the elections that they uh, participate in, and we need to work hard to try to find a solution to deal with that. The blackout period, I think, as, as people call it, into the current law, it's a few weeks before an election. You don't have to reveal who the donors are in the last two weeks. Is, is any discussion regarding that? I think you'll see the House deal with that also. I mean, we've definitely discussed it. Um, in our study committees, and I know it was discussed at, in Judiciary Committee, and I think you'll see uh, that debated on the floor as well, and, and I'm optimistic it'll be included in a reform bill. We passed that out of the Judiciary Committee uh, this week. Uh, the freshman senator from Charleston, in fact, I think he succeeded you, Paul Thurman, uh, introduced that bill, uh, and it is a 20-day blackout period currently. We have amended it for a five-day uh, blackout, and so any contribution of $100 or more uh, or expenditure, five days or more, you've got to, with the existing disclosure forms, you've got to file an amended report, report to show what has been given or what has been spent. So we, I think that'll pass the Senate quickly and hopefully the, the House will endorse that as well. 
Let me ask you about one other subject, and uh, then I'll see if there's some subjects that, that the False Claim Act, as some are, are, are saying. Can you all tell the viewers what the False Claim Act is? Well, that is, that's what's commonly called a whistleblower uh, suit allowing the, federal, the government, the state government, or a private citizen uh, to, to sue and complain effectively about fraud, uh, any type, big problem where you've got uh, areas of a state agency abusing, stealing, whatever within that agency. Uh, federal government has a whistleblower act. Many states have this. And if we are really going to get serious about ethics reform, this has got to be a part of this historic 20-year uh, effort to, uh, to fix this, where South Carolinians would have a private right to sue. The attorney generals could prosecute, could join the case, or uh, could defer. But effectively, it's the best way to, to prevent against abuse and waste of, of taxpayer dollars. Your take on that, sir? I agree completely, and I think, you know, so many times these issues get focused on the political, but, you know, government is a lot bigger than just the members elected uh, and serving here in the State House, and this kind of, of uh, legal reform would really be a ray of sunshine on government as a whole, and not just focused on elected officials, but people that serve in state government, local government at all levels and in all jobs and it would allow uh, again the public to make sure that their government is doing business the right way and give them the legal power to make sure that that actually happens. So they could actually reclaim the money that's been wasted by, by bringing the suit. Is that essentially what the theory is behind it? That's correct. Sure. All right, we got about six minutes left in the broadcast so what I'm going to do, I'll ask you, Representative, what are some of the issues that I've not asked you about that you think will come up in the debate in the House and, and be considered that potentially may be a problem or may not? You, with regard to ethics? With regard to ethics. Well, I think we've covered, you know, I think as with everything, the de devil's in the details. I mean, we've covered the broad things, income, structure of governance, um, and some other issues. Um, my personal preference would be <clears throat> to see us make structural changes, but to maintain the uh, legislative uh, parameters of our own governing body when it comes to ethics. I've been a proponent of a joint legislative ethics committee. I think that that has a good chance of being, getting serious consideration in the House to, as early as today. Um, on income disclosure, I think we need to do more and in some of these other areas. But one thing I want to point out, we need to be very careful that we don't so handicap people's ability to serve in this body that we basically, uh, without meaning to, transform this body into a full-time legislative body. Um, I don't think the people of South Carolina want to have representation by professional politicians. I think they want citizen legislators. That's been the model that we've had in South Carolina. I think you can look at U.S. Congress, states like California, and see all the potential damage that full-time legislative bodies can do to public confidence and public policy. And it's important that we have members that can come from home uh, where they're working, raising their families, bring that perspective to Columbia and make sure that it's a part of the legislative process. And if we go too far, we're going to make it so that people, um, ordinary citizen legislators cannot serve and we are turning this place over to a, a professional political class. And I don't think that would be good for South Carolina. Senator, any? issues you think that it will come up? Well, I, th I think the, the theme here is open government, transparent government, uh, and then in terms of investigating and sanctioning or disciplining our own, uh, the Senate's got a good model. The current Senate Ethics Committee, by rule, is equally based by majority and minority party. There's an even number of committee members so that there cannot be any perception that one side is taking advantage of the other. The House, I don't think, has that. But again, maybe that'll be a, a change that they embrace. Again, not so much as to perception of how we are doing with our own, but to the public and whether there's a sense that you've gotten a slap on the wrist uh, or a, a little hug and a nudge not to do anything, not to do that again. But it's, again, not so much the legislative branch that's really at, at the fore. It's the statewide perception 
again from the executive branch and kudos to Governor Haley for recognizing this as an issue and by executive order creating this task force. Again, very split in terms of Republican and Democrat uh, makeup. Uh, open, transparent, and then applying this to all city, county governments as well. We go govern ourselves and we discipline ourselves aggressively, I think. Precedent-wise suggests that in the Senate we are very aggressive about this. But it doesn't apply, it shouldn't apply only to us. Well, let me ask you, you said to all, so let me ask you this. Is any of this ethics reform, for instance, um, going to apply to agency heads, people that head up these agencies and commissions? We've, we've had serious discussions about that in the House. I think you'll see that debated on the floor um, to, to not allow agency heads to participate in fundraising uh, for the executive branch or anyone else. I think that would be a, a good change. And to Senator Rankin's point, I agree that balance is very important, and the House made that change this year. Um, and we now have a balanced ethics committee as well. We have equal representation from the parties. And that was a change we should have made a long time ago, but I'm glad we finally did that and can move forward in, with a balanced approach. We have less than two minutes in the broadcast, so I'll start with you, Senator. Is there anything you would like to tell the viewers that they need to be on the lookout for here with ethics reform in South Carolina? I am hopeful that with the, uh, the, the support of the, the League of Women Voters, uh, common calls and a number of other groups uh, that we see that there is a problem again largely perception in some instances for the legislative branch but that we will do something uh, we've heard, heard testimony from John Krangle particularly uh, as well as some other folks that have said that if we're going to do this the whistleblower needs to be in there and it needs to apply not just to us, but it needs to apply to the executive branch as well. Yeah, you wish to tell the view. I agree. I mean, I think it's important that we address this, but I also think it's important that as elected officials, we not play politics with this issue, um, that we get it right, because it will impact public policy in this state moving forward for a long, long time, and it's, it's too important to play politics with. And with that, we are into the, I would tell our viewers to watch as the home stretch of this General Assembly. The issue of ethics reform will come up. And sadly for us, we're in the home stretch of this broadcast. We're out of time. So we thank you for tuning in, and we hope uh, you will um, enjoy the topics in the weeks ahead. Thank you. Broadcast of this program is made possible in part by the South Carolina Farm Bureau, online at scfb.org and by the Columbia Metropolitan Airport online at columbiaairport.com and by Time Warner Cable online at timewarnercable.com